We're doing our study on precious marriage. This is the seventh uh, that we're in, and we are in chapter two tonight. So if you got your Bibles, you can open up First Peter chapter two. We are going to be beginning in verse six. Verse six says, "Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture: Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will." By no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word which they were also appointed. Now again, in these first two little groups of verses, in this group we have three different groups. Uh, the therefore that we talked about even last week, when it says a therefore, it's always pointing back to what was just said. It, it was talking about the first of these three groups, and that was the living stone, the chief cornerstone, the rock, speaking of Jesus Christ, the one who was rejected by the religious rulers of the day, but chosen by God. And, and, and is a quote from the Masonic Psalm, uh, speaking of the Messiah, Psalms 118. 118 says this the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone this was the lord's doing it is marvelous in our eyes and then isaiah goes to build on that same theme of the rock isaiah 28 therefore thus says the lord behold i lay in zion uh, a stone uh, for a foundation a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation whoever believes will not act hastily and then we see Jesus himself, in a sense, when he was rebuking the Pharisees because they had totally and completely rejected him, he uses the same passage. And he says this, said, Jesus said to them, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. But then Jesus goes on to say, whoever falls on that stone, they will be broken. But... On whomever that stone falls, it will grind him to powder. I remember the first time I read that when I was first saved. I'm like, whoa, whoa, that's a little heavy, Jesus. Um, but again, it is heavy, and yet those are his words. So we have the rock with a stone, as well as those who believe, those who don't believe. To those who believe, he's precious. They experience no shame. Jesus says, though they fall on him, they will be broken. But to those who do not believe, uh, it's shame, it's stumbling. And Jesus says, he will fall on them and grind them to powder. And then in verse 9, it goes on to say, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. I almost wanted to teach on that tonight, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, you're a chosen. That word chosen is elect. And having just gone through an election, we have an understanding of what that looks like. It's us choosing somebody or wanting to elect somebody. Listen, God has elected each and every one of us. Amen. Those of you watching on light, God has elected you. He's elected us. And it's an elected generation. That word generation is kin. So chosen to be in God's family. Now think about that. He has chosen us to be a part of his family. A royal priesthood, actually, literally, it's a priestly fraternity. You know, you think about if you go to college and you, you know, you're, if you're a guy, you go to a fraternity. If you're a lady, you go to a soror sorority, right? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. She probably did that. I, I never went too much. But anyways, uh, but when you go, you have to go through, you know, first you have to be asked. And then you have to go through all these hoops and jump through all this stuff, and they do all this hazing and all this other stuff just to try to be a part of this group. But God says, you are part of my fraternity that I've asked you to be. I have invited you. I want you to join. I want you to be a part, a holy nation, or really a set-apart tribe, his own special people. And I just love that. Special, we are special, or his purchased possession. And again, that we may proclaim 
or publish. What is it that we proclaim, we publish, or celebrate? It's him. It's Jesus. Again, we should all be with our lives proclaiming him. Jesus says, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before man, he's going to deny us. And yet here, Peter is saying that we would proclaim him because it's him, Jesus, who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Again, we as sinners, we're separated from God because of our sin. Uh, we're to receive our judgment, which is eternal separation from the Father, wailing, gnashing of teeth, outer darkness. But no longer are we separated from him, and we receive what we do not deserve. God holds back what we deserve. We get what we don't deserve. That's his mercy, and that's his grace. No longer separated, but that is what we get is his forgiveness, his forgiveness of sin, his eternal life, and his mercy. So again, we have these three groups. We have God, Jesus Christ, the rock, the cornerstone, the precious one, the rock of offense, and all that he's done for us, he chose us, ordained us, set us apart, purchased us. We have believing men who look to Jesus as precious, and because we believe, we receive that mercy. And then unbelieving men who experience shame and judgment, and no mercy will be shown to unbelieving man. And yet for each and every one of us, what side of the fence are we on? And yet how does this relate to marriage? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> So we'll start okay. with the ladies. Okay, so just as Pat said, uh, just for me, the, the main idea that I kind of honed in on was just this whole idea of cornerstone. In verse 6, it says, as the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. I think in your version it said, never be put to shame. And I just, I love that idea. When we choose to put our trust in the cornerstone, we're not going to be disappointed. And, uh, and I love how this even applies to our marriages. Jesus was chosen for great honor. That's what this verse tells us. He was placed here by God for us. He needs to be the cornerstone of our faith, of our marriages, and of our lives. He is the place we need to start if we want our lives to matter and to be able to survive the storms of this life. He promises us that we will never be disgraced. And so for me, this whole idea of cornerstone is Jesus needs to be the main thing. And as we sang about tonight, Christ alone, we put our trust. He is our all in all. He, that's where the buck stops and that's where it begins. And as Pat um, referenced the verse in Isaiah, verse six, it's Isaiah 28, verse 16, it says this. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. And I just love this picture here because, again, Isaiah is reminding us that Jesus is tried and true. He is a solid foundation. He's precious. He's not something, someone that we need to be afraid of. He is a safe place to dwell and to rest. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. And for me, for us as ladies, as wives, um, the bottom line is Jesus. If Jesus is our foundation, then there is going to be blessings and peace and all of the things of the Lord in my life, in, in my relationship, in our marriage. If Jesus is not my foundation, just as Pat said, the opposite will be true. There's not going to be peace and joy in the things of the Lord in my life. Is my life or even my marriage feeling a little shaky right now? I, I loved how it said that um, just that he who believes need never be shaken. And yet sometimes in our lives we find that there's kind of those shaky feelings going on. And I find that when I'm experiencing that kind of shakiness, I need to obey this verse. Whoever will believe on Jesus need never be shaken. He will provide the precious strength and stability that I'm looking for, but I need to do my part and I need to trust in Jesus. 
If you look up the word cornerstone, like I just looked it up in Wikipedia, and um, this is kind of what it describes a cornerstone. A, a cornerstone originally back in time was one of the first, often the largest, most solid, most carefully placed stones that was set in a construction project. So as they began the project, they would search out this cornerstone that had to be solid and secure, had to fit what they needed the building to look like. All the other stones would be set in reference to the stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. The chief cornerstone was actually usually the starting point of the building. Everything else was laid out according to its connection to the cornerstone. Because it often stood in the corner, they would usually make two walls come together, and um, this, this cornerstone would bind them together and form the foundation on which the entire rest of the building was going to rest. And so, you know, you think about that. In the early church, what an amazing thing that Jesus, when he came, it said that he broke down the walls of, of separation and he became our peace. He united the two stubborn walls of the Jews and the Gentiles. People who had hated each other for years, somehow Jesus came and brought about peace so that these two groups could be one in, in the church, one in the house of the Lord. And think about that for our world today. The problems, the issues that we face, if Jesus was allowed his rightful place as the cornerstone in our world, what problems would be solved? The joining of races, men together equally, without the hatred and the division that has gone on for centuries. Genders, Republicans and Democrats, neighbors, families, even husband and wives could be united as one if Jesus was in his rightful place as cornerstone. The cornerstone was the starting place for the building to be done right. Jesus should be the starting place for us to do marriage right. Maybe you say, well, we already started out wrong, so it's kind of hopeless. Jesus allows redos. Start over and rebuild your marriage with Jesus as the foundation. Allow everything to be laid out according to God's word, and watch the Lord build a beautiful house in your marriage. I love how it said in that definition that the cornerstone, it binds together two and forms a foundation on which the entire building will rest. How we need the Lord to bind us together and form the right foundation for our entire marriage to be built upon. The right foundation will survive the storms that marriage can bring. The hurts, the problems, the disagreements, we can weather those things when Jesus is the firm foundation that we've built upon. And the end result will be that our marriage will stand the test of time. You know, later in history, besides just a stone that this building was built upon, a cornerstone became more of a replica or like a ceremonial showpiece of, with an inscription. You know, you saw those buildings, those brick buildings, and it would have like that cement cornerstone there in the corner, and it would have things inscribed upon it. And it would um, often show the date of the construction, the establishment of a new company, and often it would list the builder or the architect. Again, apply that to our marriages. Does the cornerstone remind me of the date that we started to build this house of marriage together? Or was it just a day to party and celebrate? Or was it something that was being established for, for the long haul? And then again, who's listed as our builder and, and architect? Is Jesus there as the cornerstone, the builder and the architect of our marriage? Is our marriage built upon him? If not, we might need to do a redo tonight, might need to chisel out that inscription and pick the right builder and make sure that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our marriage. What was established on our wedding day? Was it a beautiful house of the Lord or, or again, just, oh yeah, I think we'll get married. You know, Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 says this, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Was our faith, was our marriage established in the faith of Jesus Christ? With all of these things, Jesus needs to be our cornerstone, our starting point. In verse 7, it says, Yes, you who trust him, recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. 
And again, as Pat、um, pointed out, this scripture is referenced multiple times in the scripture. And what I love about that is that the world is busy, busy, busy trying to get rid of God in our culture. No more Ten Commandments, no more public prayer, God can't be in the schools. You know, maybe even our money should no longer say in God we trust. Maybe it should say in God we don't trust because that's where our culture is headed. And you know what? It doesn't matter. Regardless of all that, God is still sovereign. He is still on the throne. Though the world might reject him, just like the builders did, God will still have his way. Psalm 103, verse 19 says this The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. It doesn't matter who got elected, it doesn't matter where we go as a nation or as a world. God is still on the throne, and his kingdom rules over all. How much more we need to have our lives and our marriages built upon that cornerstone, that cornerstone that is established in heaven, will rule over all one day. In our life, especially in our marriages, it doesn't matter what culture is trying to convince of a, us of. We need to keep on believing Jesus, keep on trusting Him, relying on Him. You may remember what that verse said you won't be disgraced, you won't be put to shame. Jesus will not let us down. He is the cornerstone holding us all together. Verse 8 goes on to say, He is that stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the, fet- the fate that was planned for them. When Jesus isn't honored in his rightful place, everything is out of place. Just like a building, if it starts out wrong and the cornerstone is not set right, Everything will continue to be wrong in that building project. In our marriages, for us as wives, when we dig in and trust our flesh, when we refuse to forgive, when we tolerate bad attitudes and bad actions, eventually we're going to stumble and fall. And Jesus loves us enough to allow us to do that so that we might come to our senses and come back to Him. The truth in God's word is obvious. But often people just don't want to, they just don't want to obey. That's the bottom line. I don't, I don't care what God's word says. I don't want to do it. And then they wonder why their life is full of obstacles and stumblings and falls. God offers redemption to all of mankind. It's a free gift, but he does not force anyone to receive it. That's why Peter goes on to remind us who we are and what we are to do, how we're supposed to live then. He says, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. You know, I love this because, first of all, Peter's going to point out when we build our lives upon Jesus, the cornerstone, who we are. We are privileged believers. Unbelievers don't qualify for these things. We're chosen, we're God's race. We've been given new life. We're royal priests. We have access to God, a new hope. We're a holy nation. We're God's country with sovereign God as king. We have a new reason to trust, regardless of whether you liked how the elections turned out or not. Our trust is not in the president, our trust is in the Lord. We are his very own possession, God's very own people. We have a new owner. Satan doesn't get to run our lives anymore. God's blessing is poured out upon us. And that should affect the way that I live and how I love others, how I love my spouse. And so that's why he goes on to tell us what we are to do. In verse 9, he goes on to say, As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We get to show others, show our family, even our spouse, the goodness of God. We get to demonstrate. The goodness of God as it has been shown to us. Does my husband see the goodness of God lived out through me in our home? Does he hear God's word with me or does he hear the wrath of man with me? I need to be、uh, examining what my life looks like. And if it's, if it's the negative side, then I'm not building upon that cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and I need to do a redo. 
what am I declaring? Am I a grateful, thankful woman that God has called out of darkness and the sins of my past into his beautiful image and his beautiful shining light? How easy it is for women and for all of us in general to forget to praise the Lord and to praise God for all he has done for us, where he's taken us and where he's placed us. Remember, we're chosen. We're holy. We're priests. We're his own, his own prized possession. And whether or not our husbands are obeying the Lord or doing everything right, that doesn't matter, ladies. For us as wives, we can still have hearts of praise filled by his Holy Spirit. As we will see later on in 1 Peter chapter 3, we can let that beautiful, gentle, and quiet spirit win others back to Jesus as well. And finally, in verse 10, Peter tells us, once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. We are nobodies in this world, but now we are special somebodies with God. Before we didn't belong, now we do. We are his children. We get to identify with him. Think about that. God wants to identify with us. You know, you think of people, you're like, ooh, ooh, I don't want them. I don't want anyone to know I know them. And yet God is willing to identify with us. We belong to him. Before we probably didn't feel accepted in this world, in Christ, by his grace, we are now accepted to God. Don't let the world make light of all God has done for us. We are now daughters of the king, and we are uh, his family, as, as you said. We're part of his family. And, you know, another thing, too, the world likes to make light of marriage. You know what? Be proud that you're the wife of a man of God, a man that loves Jesus, this man sitting next to you. Be proud of that. Don't let the world beat you down for that fact. Be glad and rejoice. In that verse 10, it also said, once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Before Jesus was in our lives, we were spiritually doomed. Nothing we could do that we could fix things. There was no way to be declared not guilty. But now with Jesus as our Savior, we get the gift of mercy, the gift of forgiveness. We get to be washed clean by his shed blood. Some versions um, another version um, for this whole cornerstone word, it said the chief capstone rather than cornerstone. And so I looked that up to see, well, what does that mean? And unlike a cornerstone, which was sort of the, be the beginning stone, the beginning of the building, the capstone was the opposite. It was the highest final stone to be put in place of a structure, kind of like a pyramid, for example. It would be the unique shape that would cap off the entire building. And I, I love that picture again for us as couples. While Jesus needs to be our cornerstone, the beginning, the most important stone for our marriages to be built upon, Jesus also needs to be our capstone, that precious, special stone that is set in the highest, final place of honor in our marriages. Revelation 1.8 says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God, I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. We need, ladies, to start off right with Jesus at the beginning. We need to finish things well with Jesus at the end. Again, just as we sang tonight, Christ is our all. Our hope is in Him alone. Jesus is the main thing. He is our cornerstone. Amen. Amen. And guys, for us, again, as I was reading this, and I was kind of reading the whole, you know, all the verses every single day, and I was asking the Lord to, to lead and guide and direct me, um, and I actually was struggling with this. Okay, Lord, what do you want, and how does this, you know, fit with marriage? But again, I was reminded in reading this when I got to verse 10 that it is a quote from the book of Hosea from chapter 2 there. And the book of Hosea is a love story, and it's a love story of God's faithfulness to his bride, even when she was unfaithful to him. And yet we see in the book of Hosea, the Lord telling Hosea to go get a wife, and that God would use Hosea's marriage to speak to his own people, God's wife or the nation Israel, through his marriage. So Hosea goes out and he gets married because God told him to go get married. He goes, he gets married to this woman, Gomer. And you would think that because God told him to go get married, God was behind all of this, that they would get married and live happily ever after. 
But not so the case with Hosea and his wife, Gomer. She decides to not to honor her marriage vows. She runs off and plays the harlot and does it a few times. And yet then the Lord tells Hosea, well, you go back and you, you buy, her, buy her back. And then in chapter 2, it's like God says, this is a picture of how God's people have done the same thing to him. And yet God says, even though she did all this, her heart went after other things. And then God says this. He says, me, she forgot. She wanted nothing to do with God. Yet because of God's love for her, this is what the Lord says. And again, I'm going to be reading from Hosea chapter 2, picking it up in verse 14. God says this. He says, therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. I will speak comfort to her. I will give her vineyards from there. The valley of Achor is a door of hope. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call, you will call me my husband, and no longer call me my master. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you. Verse 19 says, uh, to you, you, betroth you to me in righteousness, justice, loving kindness, mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And then verse 23, then I will sow her for myself in the earth. I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. So men, what I was picking out of this was God telling his bride, I will allure you, I will speak comfort to you, I'll give you vineyards, I'll give you the valley of Achor as a door of hope, you will call me husband and not my master, I will betroth you to me forever. And again, guys, this is really what mercy looks like especially through God's eyes. And again, the relationship was at the point where mercy was not being extended because of the way in which someone was acting. But then God decides, it's, I don't care the way they're acting. I am going to extend mercy anyways. I'm going to look beyond the way that they're acting and give mercy. And this is what God does. Listen, this is what he does each and every day for us within our own lives. The Bible says, his mercies are new Every single day. Great is thy faithfulness, it says there in the Lamentations. Uh, but, but his mercies are new every morning. But I love this because when God says, I will allure you, it's like that God says this. He says, you're my life. You're my wife. Yes, there may be problems, not on God's end, <laughs> but on, on hers or ours. Uh, and yet God says, I'm going to take you back to when we first met, when we first fell in love where we would maybe talk for hours, enjoy each other company. Again, people, listen, when we have issues in the spiritual realm, um, Jesus would tell us there as he told the church of Ephesus, you need to return to your first love. I don't know about you, but I think we all go through times of, of dryness and times where we feel like we're far away from the Lord and, and God will always remind us, go back. I have a candle from the day that I got saved. And it's there, it's kind of in the shape of a rainbow, reminds me of the promise of God. But when I look at that candle, and I go up and I smell it, it's just wax. But when I go and I smell it, I am reminded of that day that God allowed to, I, I turned to him and he chose to wash me and cleanse me of all my filth and all the yuck that was going on within my life. And when I'm reminded of that, I'm so thankful for what God has done. But listen, Sometimes in the physical realm, sometimes in the marital realm, the same applies. Sometimes there can be issues. And when issues are going on, we, we oftentimes, I think we need to be reminded of when we first met. I actually have a candle as well that someone gave us for our wedding, and it has a little, our little picture on it and stuff. And so, you know, when I look at that, I'm reminded. I, I have photos on our wall. We had some friends visiting from um, Seattle with us this last week, and one of my buddies was sitting there, and he's looking at all my walls. I even have a photo. You know, the first two are just all me and Mary. I have a photo of our first night in bed, and he's like looking at that like, hey, Pat, what's that? <laughs> That's our first night in bed. Again, we had the blankets up and everything. But anyways, it, it reminds me of our love 
and how thankful I am. How many of you guys have a picture of your first night in bed? See, am I the only one? <laughs> anyway, that's right. I am the only one. <laughs> it's special. <laughs> but again, it reminds me of the gift that God gave me and how special that she is when we first fell in love, when we actually enjoyed each other's company and were willing really to go, I know for me, willing to go out of my way to do something special for her. Guys, I believe the Lord would call us, hey, allure your wife, draw her, remind her of, of what, it, what, what we had when we first got married and what that looked like. Then he says, I, 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 I will speak comfort to you. Again, men, listen. When you first fell in love, listen, I'm, I'm going to guarantee or, or believe your words and thoughts were life to the relationship. Uh, remember when your words were words you actually thought before you spoke them, you know, when you first got, you were dating and stuff. I know with Mary, it's kind of like, okay, I don't want to say something stupid, but I want to choose my words very, very carefully. But again, your words were gentle. Your words were kind. She looked forward to every time you spoke. Listen, she was comforted by your words. She was encouraged by your words. She felt loved by your words. She felt safe by your words. And more often than not, that is how we spoke to our wives then when we first got married. And yet, how are we speaking to our wives now? Are you speaking comfort to her heart? You know what? I guarantee her heart desires to hear words of comfort from you, words of kindness from you. And yet, are we doing that? God would say, hey, guys, listen, let's speak comfort to our wives. And then he says, I, I will give you vineyards. Again, when you first fell in love, you wanted to give her things. You wanted to make her feel special. You know, money was no object, even for like in our case where you didn't have any money. But again, the vineyard, it speaks of being happy or merry or celebrating. Remember when you did all you could to make her happy? And she loved celebrating the relationship. There was joy there. She was singing there, as it told us there in Hosea. And, and, and again, uh, it, it, what is it that we're doing now within our marriages to make our wives feel special, to make her um, happy? And, and again, it's not about things. We never had money when we first got married. In fact, we had two kids. I was making five bucks an hour. I, again, we weren't living in Southern California. We were living, you know, up in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, our rent was only, I think, 250 bucks for a little house. But again, I still chose to do things, even though we had no money, to try to make my wife happy, to try to please her, to try to make her feel very, very special. And yet, sometimes, guys, in relationship, in marriage, we get comfortable in the relationship and think that trying to make her feel special isn't a part of what we need to do in the relationship anymore. But again, listen, the Lord through Peter tells us in verse 9, we are his own special people, God's purchased possession that he treasures. He looks at us as treasure. In fact, he says in his word, that he wants us, he makes us like these jewels. He puts them in a crown and he wants all the world to see how special we are. This is how God looks at us. And I think this is how he would like us to look to our wives. Does our wives feel like we treasure them, that she's special? Does, does she feel like we treat her as, as this incredible um, gift from God? Listen, she should she should. Then he goes on to say, I'll give you the valley of Achor as a door of trouble. The word Achor means, uh, it means trouble. And many of you guys remember back when Joshua had come into the land and they were going to go after a Jericho and God said, Jericho's mine. And Joshua told the people, listen, we're going to get everything after Jericho, but Jericho belongs to God. Nobody has just touched a single thing. And yet there's this guy named Achan and he goes in and he steals and he hides it in his tent and he brought about trouble for the nation of Israel. And yet again, Peter already told us in marriage, in our relationship, there's going to be trials, there's going to be tribulations. And yet, as we draw to the Lord, the trials would allow us to be closer, closer to the Lord and closer to each other. Listen, men, God can use the trouble in our marriages to cause us to draw close to our wives. 
I think we all experience these kind of things. I know for us, we've experienced those. But what we do in the midst of that, there's been times when me and Mary just hold on to each other because we got nothing else because of the things that are going on around us. But yet when we do that and not allow the enemy to get a foothold and cause us to be divided, but we grab onto each other, man, we see God's hand of mercy. We see that door of hope and that way of escape through those things. But we need to do that. Allow the Lord to draw you closer together through the trials, through the troubles, and to see that door of hope that he always provides. And I like this one. And then he says, and you will call me my husband and not my master. God says the relationship is not supposed to be about service or work or doing what I say when I say it. And if I say jump, you say how high. Listen, that is the master. That is the boss. Uh, And again, um, God isn't telling us that it should be about the master or being the boss. And, And we should listen and follow his example. God tells us the relationship is not about being the master, but it's about love. It's about intimacy. It's about friendship. Not about being served, but serving and giving our lives to our wives, living for them. Because it is about love. And because it's about love, I choose to want to serve her. I choose to want to do things for her. I desire to have that intimacy, that friendship, the companionship, working together in this marriage. Listen, guys, again, oftentimes I run across guys who they're not concerned about being the husband. They want to be the master. And if the wife doesn't treat them that way, they respond in an unhealthy way. Jesus would say, it's not about being the master, guys. Remember, he was Lord and master, and he chose to serve. It's about being the husband. And my prayer is that for all of us, our wives would look at us and look at us like the husband, not look at us like the master. Shame on us if we're doing that, but looking at us as the husband. That's what God designed marriage to be. That's what he desires for us in this marriage. And then he says, I'll betroth you to me forever. Again, betroth is to engage for matrimony. This is the for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, sickness and health, as death till death do us part, or as long as we both shall live. It's being faithful to the end, wanting and desiring to finish our marriage well, to have the Lord as part of where we're at and what we're doing. Again, men, God says, I'll allure you. I'll speak this is to his wife. I'll allure you. I'll speak comfort to you. I'll give you vineyards, give you the valley of acorns, a door of hope to call me husband. I will betroth you to me forever. And if the Lord does this with his wife, who once were not a people, but now are the people, verse 10, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Guys, this is something that we should be doing within our own marriages as well. Amen. 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 Father, again, we thank you for this incredible night, Lord. Thank you for your word, which you choose to use to take it and to speak and minister to our hearts. God, help us to understand that foundation. Lord, I pray as Mary shared, Lord, would we be built upon that rock of Jesus Christ? Lord, your word tells us all other things is like sinking sand. And if our marriage is not built upon you, it will just sink. It will just dissipate, Lord, with the the tides and the waves and the storms of life. But God, if we are built on you, we can survive the storms, the trials, all of those things. And help us, God, to, again, walk in obedience, as your word would say, Mm -hmm. to love, to desire that this relationship is is built on love. It's built on you. It's, It's about intimacy and companionship and fellowship and just being friends one with another, Lord. Would you do this work, God? Would we extend your mercy you give to us to one another, Lord? And we thank you and we do praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's couples agree by saying amen amen and amen. amen.